Hello, everyone. Welcome to our, I think, eighth episode of Women Scholars of Orthodox Christianity. I'm Aristotle Papanikolaou, and together with my colleague, George Dimakopoulos, we co-direct the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University. We invite you to visit our website at www.fordham.edu slash orthodoxy, and to, of course, visit our, our blog series, publicorthodoxy.org. We are grateful to have a great scholar and a good friend, Christina Stocco, with us today. Christina, thank you. You're in Florence. and it's Thank you for inviting there. me. So we have known each other for quite a few years. Our common interests in church and Russia and politics, and, and even though you're a sociologist, I'm a theologian, but somehow our common interests uh, brought us together. But thank you for uh, taking the time to, to be with us. And, you know, we're going to begin like we begin with um, uh, most of our programs, or practically all of our programs, just to simply to ask you, how is it that you uh, became interested in Orthodox Christianity? What, what was the hook, especially since you grew up in a village in northwest Austria, is that right? Exactly, that right? yes, right in the, in yeah. the Austrian Alps. Right. Um, I like to joke and I say that it's all the fault of my mother who gave me Dostoevsky to read far too early. Um, and I think that catches part of the truth. So I started reading Russian literature very early. And then I, uh, when I went to university to study comparative um, literature, I chose Russian as the second language. And, and I think at that point, um, I was lucky because my professor at the time um, of Russian literature uh, turned out to be uh, the translator of uh, Vladimir Solovyov into German. And so I got quite a lot of Russian religious philosophy of the Silver Age just by studying Russian literature, which was really a coincidence. And, and then the second moment uh, where I got even closer to sort of orthodox topics was again a coincidence. I took um, a seminar at the philosophy department on Dostoevsky's brothers Karamazov. And, and there was a, a Greek student there who, who um, had read a lot of Yanaras. And, and so he gave us all this interpretation of the brothers Karamazov based on Yanara's uh, ideas about the West. Um, and I felt very provoked. Um, yeah. But when I feel provoked about something, yeah. yes. when I feel provoked about something, I tried to get to the bottom of it. So I actually started reading Yanara's. Yeah. And uh, the first book I read by him was um, Person and Eros, mm -hmm. which I think is interesting because it's in been German, translated. In, in, yes, in, I read in it German, in German right? mm -hmm. because it's been translated into English much, much later. Much later, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I've read that in German. Yeah, that's in a way how I got hooked onto Orthodox theology mm. topics. So a bit of a combination of the Russians and the Greeks. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I, for, I haven't done this in a month, so I forgot to read your bio, but I'm going to integrate aspects of your bio, which our, 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 our viewers, our listeners can find on the website, but also just simply Googling your name, we'll see some of the things you're involved with. Um, but I'm going to sort of integrate very as, at various aspects of it. But, and one of the aspects I'm going to integrate is the fact that you, you, your, your first research project, your dissertation, was sort of integrating these Greek and Russian elements. I have the book right here, uh, Community After Totalitarianism, the Russian Orthodox Intellectual Tradition and the Philosophical Discourse of Political Modernity, right? So these early interests actually produced the fruit here in this particular Exactly. Book, I, think, right? mm -hmm. I think that PhD thesis was very much my way of getting around the initial puzzlement when reading Yanaras. Mm -hmm. um, so what I basically asked myself at the beginning of that dissertation, which I wrote at the European University Institute in Florence, was um, so that type of critique that in a way very modern critique of the West from an orthodox perspective that Yanaras is uh, putting forward in his early works where he draws a lot on Heidegger. Um, does something similar exist in Russia? Did it develop in Soviet Russia at that point or did it develop maybe in immigration? That was a very naive question I asked because I, I didn't really have much guidance at that point. So I, um, at the beginning of my PhD thesis, I um, sort of very naively traveled to 
uh, Moscow, uh, spent one month in uh, the Lenin Library, and uh, and read myself through um, um, Vaprosi Philosophy, which is a philosophical journal and other philosophical journals from the late Perestroika period to, to well, basically to the time when I was there, trying to understand, so who is it that writes in the spirit of Russian religious philosophy? And, and the people like I, I sort of pick, pinpointed and I thought were interesting were two. And I want to show you, I want to share a slide um, to make it easier for the listeners to follow the names I'm, I'm gonna mention. Um, so the two people, let me see whether that works. While you're getting the slides, I'm just gonna invite our viewers mm -hmm. to of course ask questions in the Q and A function that you see at the bottom right hand corner there or bottom right of your uh, Zoom screen. So please do, uh, uh, the chat function is not enabled. So we do encourage you to ask and to participate and to submit your questions in the Q&A function. Uh, so go ahead, Christina. Yes, so in, in that PhD thesis, which was published as uh, the, the book that you showed, Community After Totalitarianism, mm -hmm. um, I engage in depth with the thought of these two Russian um, philosophers, uh, Vladimir Bibikin um, and Sergei Haruji. Mm -hmm. So of the two, I only managed to meet personally Sergei Haruji and, and a friendship developed in a way out of that encounter. Um, and what I found fascinating in the works of both of them is how they engaged from an orthodox perspective with contemporary Western thought. Uh, Vladimir Bibikin is the translator of Heidegger into Russian. Um, he's written very interesting works which are very difficult to read in Russian for me as hardly anything is translated. Um, and, and Sergei Haruji likewise uh, builds on, on that legacy and um, because I actually think it's really interesting to, to dig into that corner of orthodox thought, I, I edited a book which I also uh, put here, which is Haruji's engagement with Foucault, practices of the self and spiritual practices, Michel Foucault and the Eastern Christian discourse. Um, that was published in English with Erdmanns. So that in a way was also a result of my PhD thesis, came out much later. Um, and maybe just to, to make that very clear, in that thesis, I don't really engage with the Russian Orthodox Church at all. Right. I was interested in, in lay Orthodox thinkers, right. basically, uh, in the late Soviet period. Well, because around the time you were writing your thesis, or at least getting into that research, it was around that time that the Russian Orthodox Church itself was sort of still sort of uh, maybe finding its way. I'm not really sure if that's the right way to put it, or maybe um, trying to f uh, figure out, as we say, uh, how it will position itself within society, culture, and uh, I mean, and that led to, I mean, further research to some extent, right, which a book which came out a little bit later, but still an extension of your interests, but we're also maybe seeing, in fact, how the Russian Orthodox Church is playing a bigger role now in terms of some of, because you are, I mean, you're not a theologian, you're not a historian, no. you're a professor of sociology at uh, Innsbruck University in Austria, right? So you're a sociologist, but I know that you're also a political theorist, right? Because even though you don't have here, you know, political uh, science or political theory, you are an expert in political theory, right? So you have uh, sort of your expertise in various areas, right? Um, exactly. I mean, exactly. You're right. In a way, um, maybe I forgot to mention it. So I, I, my first degree is in comparative literature. Yeah. Um, and I kind of realized at that point that uh, comparative literature is, is a very hard a uh, place to start off um, a career, an academic career, any career. Um, and I, so I continued with a master's program at the Central European University in Budapest in European studies and international relations. So that was as far as one could get away from Russian religious thought, but um, it sort of helped me to shift um, field from humanities to social sciences. Mm. Um, and, and my PhD was in social and political uh, sciences, but obviously on a chair with, in political theory. And, 
that uh, social science identity of mine has become ever stronger and and my shift of interest to the Russian Orthodox Church as an institution and um, to church state relations is very much related also to that shift of becoming more social science like um, you know I don't hide that this was in a way also part of a, of a career calculation again Russian religious thought is not is not a very good place to start off with the Russian Orthodox Church at that point was a much more interesting and sexier topic <laughs> even though I have to admit that um, when I started my postdoc in Austria, I had a lot of people who, who said, why do you do orthodoxy? You should do Islam. Everyone's talking about Islam. And I'd say, well, I don't speak any of those languages. I mm -hmm. speak Russian. That's my expertise. And I'm very glad I stuck to that. Well, but it's interesting. I mean, that's in, I mean, in, in the 90s, when I started getting interested in these issues, I mean, the issues of sort of the, and we're, we're sort of now going to move into this territory, the issue of orthodoxy and democracy and the compatibility and confronting questions, especially in orthodoxy for the first time in the post-communist, post sort of empire kind of period. I mean, the, the natural uh, sort of comparison was with Islam. Uh, and, you know, uh, this famous thesis by this Harvard professor, Samuel Huntington, which for those of you who haven't heard of him, basically talked about this clash of civilizations um, basically that there were certain civilizations not compatible with democracy, but others who are. And the two that he listed basically were orthodoxy and, and Islam. I'm, I'm simplifying the thesis a little bit, but that's ultimately what he uh, said, as you know. But what's interesting is that within the European context, which is strange because, you know, most Europeans, I think, have some sense of what orthodoxy is. At the same time, they kind of ignored it. <laughs> they were focusing on Islam. Um, but now we see that, and this is kind of, this is really where your current work is to some extent, right? I mean, they, they ignored it to their detriment to some extent because they didn't see lurking on the horizon how in fact uh, what was happening within the Orthodox countries would affect, would affect Europe, would affect yes. Western Europe, right? So you, yeah. you did the book, uh, I, don't, I, don't have a, I don't have a book here um, because I have it in PDF form, but you did uh, your your next monograph was the Russian Orthodox Church and Human Rights in 2014, and around that time, uh, you brought um, uh, uh, when you were in Austria at the um, uh, remind me the name the Institute for Institute for Human Sciences right the Institute for Human Sciences. When you were a fellow there, you brought many of us together, including our friends Pandelika Ladzidi, Sefi Foka. Uh, 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 Andrei uh, uh, Shishkov and so many others, and uh, you, we, you know, through that this this book came together, which we co-edited with uh, Ingeborg Gabriel, Political Theologies and Orthodox Christianity, which is a wonderful set of collection, which uh, provides a, a a lot of different viewpoints mm -hmm. and really shows how political theologies and orthodoxy is a, is a sort of a thing now, right? Uh, because yes. in, in fact, uh, things were happening within post-communist. Orthodoxy now uh, that were deserving of attention, that were making an impact beyond the borders of Orthodox Christianity, uh, even in terms of how the Russian Orthodox Church was dealing with the human rights questions, which you talk about here, right? And uh, you know, it's it's led to this uh, European Research Council-funded project, post-secular conflicts project, which I'm honored to be on the advisory board there, and I've been part of many seminars. So your early interests, your dabbling in literature and then now expertise in sociology and uh, political theory and uh, you're getting there as a theologian a few more years together and we'll and, yeah, and we, yeah, I may I'll, end up there I'll give you an honorary degree in uh, <laughs> <laughs> theology. So, I have to say all, all these things are coming all these things have come together into something now which is really very interesting and having a global impact and why don't you tell us more now about yes, I, I, I will do that. how and where they're going. I will do that. First, I want to say something. I'm very proud of that book we edited together, The Political yes. Theologies in Orthodox Christianity, mm -hmm. especially because I felt when you were all there in Vienna that we had really achieved something by having you all sit at the table. Because mm -hmm. what I realized when I interact with Orthodox scholars um, is that um, the Greeks are suspicious of the Russians and, and the Russians really don't con want to talk to the Romanians. And, and so there, there is a whole dynamic on the table, which I, is very difficult for me to grasp as an outsider. But then I also feel that being an outsider, I actually have a chance of 
making people talk and interact in a setting um, that is that that works and and, and for that for that book always, it worked. You were know, always fair too. That's the thing I always admire about you is that you were you you were always fair and you were uh, uh, as objective as you could be and always tried to give people the benefit of the doubt and that's. Uh, that's, that's really, uh, to some extent, rare sometimes in scholarship, and something that the when uh, when you're when you're in the in the tradition and the stakes are high, sometimes you can lose focus of that. Yes, so. well, and I think the stakes are high, and maybe for me they were different. Now, I would, I mean, you 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 went really fast now, but I think I have to go back for a moment to the. To the, I share my screen again, to the um, Russian Orthodox Church and Human Rights book. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, um, so this was really a study of the document uh, of 2008 of the Russian Orthodox Church, the teaching of, of the Russian Orthodox Church and human freedom, dignity, and rights. Right. And I wanted to A little bit of background. I mean, the Russian Orthodox Church. Yes, I can explain that. Within so, a, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So what, what, what I found really interesting is that in the social doctrine, which was published by the Russian Orthodox Church, Moscow Patriarchate in 2000, the concept of human rights is very strongly condemned as something that has nothing to do with the Orthodox tradition, something that um, emerges out of uh, Western enlightenment and secularism and is really a rival uh, moral regime that, that needs to be fought against. And, can I, so and that, if I can just intervene mm -hmm. here and give a little bit of background that particular critique is not necessarily uh, uh, new or original because it, it occurs within even Western Christian uh, and Western philosophical traditions as well in terms yes. of this critique of human rights and so on and so forth. So, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so that in, in, as such wasn't surprising and in that sense not interesting, but what was interesting and surprising was that only eight years later, the Russian Orthodox Church publishes a new document um, on human freedom, dignity, and rights, where they um, engage with the human rights concept. Now, I'm not going to say that they engage really positively with it, but but they they embrace it partially. Um, and I thought that was interesting. Um, against the background of a different debate I was involved in, which was really more in political theory, about um, Jürgen Habermas' concept of a post-secular society. And, and here's another edited volume I, I just want to draw your attention to, which I um, edited with a colleague uh, at the University of Rome at the time, Multiple Modernities and Post-Secular Societies. And the question we asked, so uh, Massimo Rosati was working on Turkey at the time, I was working on Russia. We were really asking how a post-Kemalist or a post-Soviet society, um, how religious actors after that period enter into public debate and, and, and the political sphere with their arguments or how Habermas calls it with their instances. And, and Habermas famously um, coined these two key concepts, the complementary learning process between secular citizens and religious citizens who should learn to argue with each other and who should also learn to engage in a reciprocal translation um, in order to make themselves understood to each other. And I, in a way, my question was very simple to that document. I just asked, is, is, that, is, is, is it that what the Russian Orthodox Church is doing in writing that document? Are they actually engaging in a complementary learning and a reciprocal translation? That was, that was in a way the question in the book. And in order to do that, um, I'm, again, I'm a social scientist. I worked qualitatively with a very detailed document study. Um, I also uh, did interviews with actors. Um, I, I actually got uh, to many of the, of the members of the working group who had drafted that document inside the Moscow Patriarchate. And, and uh, it was very interesting to see how there are just very many different voices inside the, that Moscow Patriarchate, even in that working group. Um, um, who, who are working out these positions. And so some of these actors were really sincerely thinking that this was a learning process and others were really cynical. And, and in a way that realization um, became then the starting point for, for my current project, the post-secular conflicts project. Um, namely the realization that there is something in these processes of 
a tradition like the Russian Orthodox Church engaging with modern society that has the potential for a really sincere change inside that tradition. And at the same time, it has a potential for a very, I would almost say, cynical confrontation um, with the secular order or a democratic regime. That, that was the starting point. Yeah. And maybe at this point, I should also say that, I mean, that all now sounds as if I had all the time known what I was be doing, but it wasn't actually true because um, I never had a, I, I was in a very precarious academic position. Um, I had no, no contract with any university and I didn't really know where I would end up. And these European Research Council starting grants are very important grants if, if one gets it. Very difficult ones to get for our They're very difficult ones to get as well. Enormously difficult, and especially with religious or even uh, themes that have uh, some vague theological connection to it. Very difficult. Yeah. So um, I put a lot of effort into designing that project. Um, I actually had Effie. Effie Focus, she also got an ERC grant a year before me. I had her kind of as a role model to follow. Yeah, um, and, and then I got that grant and that really changed everything. I mean, it, first of all, it meant that I got a position at university and then it meant that I could do that research that I really wanted to do, um, to work on this, um, on this phenomenon of, of the Russian Orthodox Church engaging with uh, the West, with modern society, with modern topics in a way that has this dual face. Um, um, is it a learning process or is it, is it very, um, a very pragmatic power game? Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you are involved in that project and I should say at this point, something came into the picture which had never played a role uh, before in my research and that was the United States. Um, because I'd never looked to the West. I was always interested in Russia and um, I'd never really looked to the US except for roles and kind of political theory. And um, studying the Russian Orthodox Church um, approach to human rights, um, I stumbled across so many connections with the American Christian right. And I, um, I now come to, the, to, to this concept which wasn't in my thought before, and that's the concept of the culture wars. Yeah. Um, uh, and in a way, yes. So now I very much feel that my research is about Russia and the Russian Orthodox Church in the globalizing culture wars. Right. But it's not what I looked for in the beginning. I, well, I ended up there. Well, that's what I admire about you, though, too, because I've seen, we've known each other for a while, and I've seen you sort of you 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 have a, a curiosity uh, right and and that's how scholarship should be i mean we all have you know our locations and our biases as everybody says but there is also wonder and curiosity and you always you went from curiosity to curiosity to curiosity and sort of stumbled on things and and you found and you stumbled on new ways in which it had to be expressed right i mean i think I mean, you, we talked about this and you initially said that, you know, the word post-secular post initially filled you with hope, right? In the sense that there could be real positive ways of religion uh, somewhat being, playing a role within uh, modern societies. We know our friend Jose Casanova, of course, has written on that and continues to write and has a wonderful series at the Berkeley Center on uh, secularism and globalization. And uh, so, um, and, and then, uh, I'm not, this may be, uh, this is maybe just to draw on your word cynicism. It's not that you've grown cynical. It's just that you've seen the direction it's taken. And you've yes, seen you now that this post-secular, which means that somehow religion has been revived. I mean, as if it really went away anyway, it really didn't. But so, but somehow this post-secular has, has revived in, especially in the Orthodox countries but it's taken a direction that ultimately now we have to bring in this new word, not, not new, but new to the orthodox situation of culture yes. wars, yes. culture yes. wars, to really explain now how this post-secular in fact has, has taken shape. So yeah. can, you, can you speak that a little bit? Give us a, like a little brief history on 
on uh, Hunter's use of uh, cultural wars in the United States and then uh, take us into uh, uh, the, the post-secular conflicts project. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, sh I just show that slide uh, so you can take that in and away the title and the topic. Well, I mean, James Davison Hunter is an American sociologist of religion and he, um, he wrote a book in 1981, <laughs> no, 1991 it was published, mm -hmm. uh, called American Culture Wars, uh, The Struggle to Define America, where he really describes the confrontation between progressive social groups in the United States and, so, and social conservatives. Um, which, which he calls either fundamentalists or orthodox, but he doesn't think about, I mean, in the sense of orthodox believers, uh, strictly observant believers. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, on, and, and the questions these culture wars develop on are questions of morality politics, the moral conflicts. And the key issue, of course, in the United States at the time when he studies this um, is, is abortion. Um, but there could be, a, there were other topics. There were also topics like uh, tobacco control or in, in Europe, we had, we had other important morality topics in a way. Um, then in the 90s, we had um, um, homosexuality and now we have gay marriage as, as central topics around which pro progressive groups and conservative groups um, enter into a culture war and into a battle with each other. And now the question that, that really, in a way, struck me and the observation I, I, I made looking, studying how the Russian Orthodox Church enters these debates is that, um, to put it very bluntly, um, many Orthodox, Russian Orthodox actors just copied Christian right speech topics. And, and I wanted to find out why because conservative Russian Orthodox are actually really anti-Western. They don't like American evangelicals and they don't like America anyway, and, and they don't like the West. And why do I suddenly start to speak like that? And again, because I'm a, I'm a social scientist, I, and I had this big project and all this money to actually do field work and research, uh, we started to go to Russia, go to conventions and ask and study literature and, and um, find out. And, and what really started to unfold is I, I think a story that hasn't been told yet, and I, I will tell it in a book that, that I hope to publish next year called uh, Moralist International, the Russian Orthodox Church in the Global Culture Wars. And that's the story of the Russian Orthodox Church learning the culture wars and then starting to do the culture wars. And the learning part happens from 1990 onwards. Mm -hmm. um, and there were, very, there, there were Americans who were traveling to Russia um, for the purpose of moral education. I mean, we know about that because there was a big debate about proselytism in the 90s. And the Russian Orthodox Church in 97 um, achieved this law that would keep uh, Protestant groups out of Russia, the law on religious freedom that was very strict. But what is in the shadow of that law and of that debate on proselytism is that um, these groups were not only proselytizing, they were doing moral education. I mean, they were bringing um, information material on abortion, um, information material on, on the gay marriage issues that were, were maybe emerging at the time. Um, they were giving money to translate the material. Um, and they were acting as interlocutors for policymakers. And, and that's an interesting part for many academics. So what I found out in what we really found out in the research project is that it's not the Russian Orthodox Church that starts to learn the culture wars first. It's academics, mm -hmm. sociologists, demographers, interestingly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the Russian Orthodox Church until, and now until, the nine, until around 2000 is, very, is, is resistant to these influences because they recognize them as Protestant and Western and whatever. And then it's really the work of, of now Patriarch Kirill and at the time uh, Metropolitan Kirill who, who says we have to engage with that. We have to, we have to really start a dialogue with these groups in the West and they do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in a way the story that we want to tell in the book. Um, and, 
And the, the post-secular conflicts research project enabled us to do a lot of interviews. We have more than 100 interviews, um, two thirds of which are with Russian actors. And we basically asked them, so how did you come up with that topic? Um, how did you learn about that? And, and, you know, then you get these moments in interviews, which are just really enlightening when someone says, well, you know, I think I was one of the first ones who had an email address. Um, and then I got all these information material about abortions. And then we thought, well, maybe we should do something about that. Now, just to say the Russian Orthodox Church did not have abortion on its screen as the first thing to do in the early 90s. There's a lot of research about that, about the Soviet abortion culture, which was not thought of as problematic. Mm -hmm. And then it picked up the battle. The same with, uh, with uh, the LGBT and, and, and gender questions. I mean, this is something that is very far away from, from Russian reality. And, and how come it becomes such a central topic so fast? So, and here again, I'm at the post-secular topic because the whole idea about post-secular society was about translation and mutual learning. And I think what we see now is that there's clearly a lot of translation and mutual learning going on. But a lot of political liberal theory was completely naive in thinking that only liberal ideas would be translated. A lot of Christian conservatism, social conservatism is, gets translated and received all the same. Yeah. And I think that's the situation we have now. Um, but, yes. can, but there's a, but there's a, but now, but now it's gone as, as, you, as you've written about the, the Russian Orthodox, I mean, the Russian Orthodox Church and Russia in general has played a role in globalizing. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I mean, this is something we need to kind of uh, discuss maybe and kind of nuance a little bit in the sense that did they, I mean, you know, Russia likes to be, you know, Russia aspires to be a, a superpower. That's no secret, obviously, uh, within the global context. And it seems as if these particular kinds of social issues, um, it's are being leveraged to uh, perhaps project a certain kind of yes. global power. Exactly. I mean, this is, this is why I said before that uh, I think we actually have to distinguish two periods of Russia and the Russian Orthodox Church learning the culture wars, and then they start doing the culture wars. And the the moment where that changes is around 2008, between 2012. Mm -hmm. So why 2008? It's the year when, uh, well, it's 2009, really, January 2009, when Kirill is elected uh, to the Patriarchate. And it's 2012 when, when Putin uh, becomes president for a third time. I mean, that, that's the widely recognized year of Russia's conservative turn. But it's important to recognize that that conservative turn was prepared for a long time by people who could not have guessed that at one point they'd be in the center of power and have access to all the means they now have access to. Um, so I think that um, it's true that the Russian government is now picking up um, social conservatism as its new role in, in the world. And we see that very clearly at the UN, at the Council of Europe. Um, well, I mean, you, you have written about it. Um, even though I think to a certain extent it has backfired because this conservative Russia is not so much about the church, it's very much about Putin. Um, so I'm actually not sure whether that was so much in the interest of, of the patriarchate. Um, Yes, the culture wars have globalized and, and, and Russia sees its role now as, as the leader of a, of a global conservative right. Others, others see them as leader to some extent, right? Because oh, yes. this is an interesting, so in to some extent American, one could say um, here within sort of the United States, American evangelicals uh, as one example, although they have, they have their own alliances with other uh, various kinds of uh, Christians, uh, Catholic, mm -hmm. But American evangelicals seem to be the ones on the forefront of this in terms of the international connections, right? I mean, they... Yeah. they and that, also American Catholics, you know, and or Catholics in general. But they see um, that somehow within the United States, certain... They, they, they've lost the battle, so to speak, on certain issues. They've turned to something like uh, religious freedom, 
in the sense of making sure that they don't have to bake a, a cake for uh, someone, uh, you know, that has a, you know, is having a gay marriage or something like that. Yes. Issues. So they, they now see that perhaps on the international scene, they can have more of an effect, right? And somehow Russia has seen, Russia is seen as a kind of leader in terms of conveying these particular kinds of values, right? These yes. kinds of uh, hopes and aspirations. And, um, and just one last comment. I mean, it's interesting in the Orthodox world because in places like Romania and Serbia, I mean, you, there's a bit of a tension. I mean, politically, they want to be somehow with the EU. In a way, Russia, politically, is always defining itself against the EU. And so within Romania and Serbia, there's um, tension of uh, somehow this political um, sort of negotiation, let's say, uh, with its membership or its relationship with the EU. But I would say that the predominant religious rhetoric is culture warlike. Yes. And, and, and very similar, to some extent in Greece. I mean, Greece, the EU relationship is established. That's, there's no debate about that. But as we saw with Yanadas, there is a particular, it's a different kind, but it's, there's a particular kind of cultural war language, uh, even within Greece. So across the Orthodox world, I mean, there is cultural war language, but Russia has somehow been, pro has projected it both internally and externally uh, in alliance with Amer American evangelicals. And I mean, by doing so, Russia has strengthened um, the populist right in Europe and in the countries you mentioned. And I think just maybe to, to, to uh, um, give a bit more detail on the EU question. So what, what these groups object to is the European Union getting into social policies. They don't, they don't mind the common market, um, uh, but they do mind uh, the EU um, passing laws that will infringe on social policies. Um, one, one very important point is, for example, the EU anti-discrimination directive, um, with, which includes also a, a, um, gender equality. Um, so inside the European Union, there are a lot of groups that are critical of Brussels as this bureaucratic monster. Um, and it, these groups have now discovered social policy as a field of combating the EU. Um, and, and again, here human rights in a way is the key because um, the European Union has a fundamental charter of, of, of rights. Um, so it, it, it has a human rights agenda that, um, that has the potential to overrule sovereign decisions. Um, so uh, it's very much about legal sovereignty also in these countries that um, elected governments can say, well, we can't discriminate who we want. <laughs> the, the EU actually will, uh, will sort of give us a, a framework. I mean, you, which happens and, and, and if they don't comply as the case with Poland right now or with Hungary, um, they will get um, a court case of the EU against the member state. Um, so there's a lot of uh, debate inside the European Union of how far the EU can go in terms of social policies and, and human rights issues in the member states. And, and the Orthodox countries are definitely on the side of those that want, yes, a common market, but not a common EU of social policies. And these groups inside the European Union are strengthened by Russia um, in ways that are maybe not always transparent. And I think that's, that's also something that fuels fear um, of Russia. How does this affect, I mean, this is coming to me now because I, um, Again, I, I sort of, I've been listening to, again, our friend Jose's, um, um, Casanova's uh, um, uh, webinars at the Berkeley Center, which I recommend to everyone here. And um, just in terms of Islam and Europe, let's say, for example, right? I mean, you, you did a book on multiple modernities and that shows to some extent what we call secularization within Europe takes on different forms. So for example, what it looks like in Norway is going to be different. How it looks like in France is going to be different. How it looks like in Italy to some extent. And that all depends a little bit on uh, the degree to which one thinks that marginalizing religion is important for freedom or something like that. And that what, that one of the things that occurred to me as I was listening to some of these webinars was that, that these, the, the secularization takes a different shape when it's about Christianity. But with Islam coming into Europe, with Muslim immigrants coming into Europe, 
it takes a little bit more of an exclusive stance. In other words, it takes yes. a little bit more of a kind of um, uh, uh, sort of, uh, oh no, we have to absolutely regulate these uh, immigrants uh, or these Muslim migrants, otherwise our freedoms are in jeopardy. And I'm wondering whether um, something similar li like that is happening uh, in relationship of Western Europe uh, to what they see happening in Russia or whether they're still not necessarily worried about that. Uh, so the Russian uh, influence in terms of the UN Human, Co Human Rights Council or uh, just to see the, the way Russia is globalizing the culture wars, whether they see that as some kind of threat within their own particular countries or uh, because, yeah, anyway, I yeah. don't know whether... Uh, no, I think, I think there is, to some extent, there is a lot of confusion because most commentators and I think also many policymakers, they don't really take religion serious. So um, they may they see now that that Russia is playing the conservative and and orthodox civilization card, and they call it symbolic politics or soft power, um, as if all of this only works because the state in that moment wants it and uses it. Mm -hmm. I think we have to take the religious element in this uh, more serious in a way. It has a life of its own also. And, um, and we, we've seen it. So it's been there before and it, it's not only there by the grace of the Kremlin. And um, I think what has happened to the European populist right is that um, it's always been against immigration. Um, but now the Orthodox have become a very important ally against Islam. Um, I, I, because you know, yes. they strengthen the Christian identity of Europe. And I mean, the Orthodox churches uh, in Europe, they have their own complicated history with Islam. But that's tricky, but, that's, but I can see that in other European countries and in, in Orthodox countries, but that's tricky in Russia though, right? Because there's a sizable... That's very tricky in Russia, yes, exactly. Yeah. That's actually one point where, where it doesn't work that well. Yeah. But I mean, Russia, um, Russia is different because it's an, it has this imperial past in a way. So it says, well, we are a multi-religious country. Mm -hmm. Um, but if I, for example, looking at, at, the, at, the, connect, at the relationships between the Italian Lega party, which is of the Italian populist right-wing party, or the, the Austrian right-wing party, I mean, these were not Christian platforms yeah. 10 years ago, and they have become so. And as they have become so, they've moved closer to Orthodox actors in Russia. I mean, we, we, we've seen that. Um, and, and I think that that's very interesting. I mean, that, that, that's really something new. So, I mean, just again, these things are just occurring to me now. I mean, Europe, Western Europe is worried about, um, sort of the influx of, uh, Muslim immigrants, right? I mean, so much so that it's affecting German policy in terms of the Greek Turkish, um, what might call it conflict now in sort of the, uh, Southeastern Mediterranean. Um, but clearly there are many Orthodox uh, immigrants, one could say, uh, flooding into Western Europe. And uh, they don't, I mean, there's, you don't, there's no sense of worry there that somehow they're also going to kind of affect the, the, secularist, the secularist balance, let's say, within each country, or there's, there's no worry there that somehow they, that they're going to bring with them this kind of... Um, uh, cultural war or this kind of, uh, yeah, maybe I'm stretching. Well, yes, I think you're, you're stretching it now because, yeah. I mean, there, there have been countries in, in the EU, Czech Republic, for example, but also Hungary, who said, well, we take Syrian refugees, but only if they're Christian. Right? No. You know, as if, as if that's sort of um, the criterion for, for, for granting asylum. Um, and I mean, you say, yes, there are, there are, but they are not, I mean, they're Orthodox work migrants a lot, but they, I mean, they're, they're EU citizens. Yeah. And, and so I, I really don't think that's, that's an issue in, in that sense. Well, it, it plays a little bit into the, how the, the, within the Orthodox world, there's, there's a bit of a tension, right? I mean, there's a sense in which in, within the Russian world, there is politically, there's a self identification against the EU. And the Russian Orthodox Church, at least culturally, is sort of trying to create this diametrical opposition. Within the other Orthodox countries, the religious rhetoric is this more cultural 
self-identification against the other. But politically, there is constant negotiation and uncertainty and ambivalence, and um, but not quite a rejection of the EU. I'm not yeah. quite. A, I'm not quite of a, a defining against. Um, so we have. We do have some questions. I want to get to. Wait. Wait. Uh, can I just? Do yes, of course. Can do I, I wanted to share one. Oh, sorry. Right. I wanted to share one more. One more picture because I think we. I think we went a bit fast on the point of um, admiration for Russia um, in the American Christian right. Mm -hmm. And um, because that was so striking, um, we <laughs> recently edited a, a volume entitled Post-Secular Conflicts, Debating Tradition in Russia and the United States, where we published um, some four, basically four of the very significant interviews we did with people who granted us the right to, um, to publish them. Um, one of them is with um, Ellen Carlson, who is the founder of the World Congress of Families, mm -hmm. um, who founded that Congress in the mid 90s with a Russian partner. And um, so he's, he's a, a standard representative, I think, of, of a pro family American um, Christian organization. And he very clearly expresses this idea that Russia is sort of the new beacon of hope. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in a way, if, if people want to sort of get a feeling for, for the kind of material we are dealing with here, um, I recommend that you have a look at the book, which is Open Access. Mm -hmm. And I should also say that because I'm always so puzzled by how Orthodox are learning these arguments, the book includes a whole section of Orthodox theologians, including you, Aristotle, um, um, refuting, in a way, <laughs> this identification of Orthodox Christianity with uh, Christian conservatism mm -hmm. um, wholesale. Um, so th that's a debate we, we, we had in that book. And yeah. I wanted to draw your attention to it. Oh, very good. Um, and of course, we have a, a mutual friend, uh, Sarah Riccardi Schwartz, who does a lot of work on the way um, uh, some members of the sort of American far right have uh, looked to Russia and symbolized Russia in ways that uh, as, as kind of these global the global hope, for example, of, of some kind of instantiation of values or, um, and so there's a lot of uh, discussion and research around, around these questions. And I just wanted to, I wanted to ask one quick question before I get to some of the questions now that have showed up in the Q and A, but, um, but Russia is a very diverse place, right? And we hear of course, of uh, the figure of Alexander Men, and there's a tradition of a community that tries to carry on his legacy and uh, which is um, a little bit different way of thinking about orthodoxy, not quite cultural war-ish. And uh, I mean, can you share with us anything a little bit more about uh, uh, the diversity within the Russian Orthodox Church within Russia in terms of maybe it's just its everydayness, right? It's, it's, it's parish life, it's everydayness. Um, I know the, 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 one of the parishes uh, associated with Alexander Men was uh, taking in some of the protesters and, and, and advocating for them and even coming out and uh, perhaps saying publicly that uh, the Pussy Riot um, uh, members that were prosecuted shouldn't have been prosecuted. And so there's a, I mean, we hear about the Russian Orthodox Church Institution, Kirill, Putin and all that, but um, is there anything maybe right now that just for briefly you want to maybe say about the everydayness of and yeah. the diversity of Russian Orthodox life? I mean, I think sort of everyday Russian Orthodoxy is still very diverse, exactly in the way that you describe. Um, but the Moscow Patriarchate is no longer. And I think this is a real difference to maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. Where, there, where you would have uh, people in, in important positions um, that were identifiable uh, for holding very different views. Uh, I mean, a big example maybe who was uh, Metropolite Larion and, and uh, Fsevolo Chaplin, who, who was mm -hmm. sort of very connotated very conservative, and Ilarion, who had, had sort of the more liberal part. Um, well, I mean, I think that has now changed. Um, the Moscow Patriarchate has become very streamlined on social conservative topics, on um, support of the Russian government. And um, if anything, maybe in everyday church life, that has led to more divisions, mm -hmm. as we've seen with these protests. Right. Um, I mean, it was a real new thing that, um, that Russian priests would actually sign a petition 
Mm. But then we also mustn't forget that the situation in in Ukraine, and it wasn't all, it wasn't it was it happened already before the autocephaly for the Orthodox Church of Ukraine in 2018. It was already with the war um, that um, sort of a government conforming nationalist and let's call it sort of right wing church. Uh, prevailed and that uh, voices that would look for moderation um, were easily accused of being sort of anti-patriotic or unpatriotic and um, risked to be sidelined. So um, actually I'm I'm not so optimistic uh, regarding the, the Russian Orthodox Church, at least in its institutional structure at the moment. And I mean, I've written a, a short piece on public orthodoxy about that, which I called the end of post-Soviet religion, mm -hmm. um, where I basically said post-Soviet religion was really in the end pluralistic. It had the potential to develop into everything. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think that is in a way over what we'll see in the next years or maybe decades, but time runs very fast in Russia, maybe it will only be years, is um, a, conser a nationalistic and very conservative or Russian Orthodox Church prevail. Uh, just to, to conclude that, the, the new constitutional project which was passed uh, this spring, mm -hmm. the, the, the actors who were really vocal were exactly these actors I study, the ones that were learning and now are now doing the culture wars, Konstantin Malofeyev, for example. They have affected, they've in fact affected, um, uh, they're affecting you know, po policy and constitutional yes. formation and uh, in a way that um, uh, many, many 10 or 12 years ago wouldn't have predicted. No. Uh, but now all of a sudden that has somehow changed it. Any quick insight before I get to questions? Any quick thoughts on Belarus and the relationship to the Belarusian protests um, from the Russian Orthodox Church or anything, anything you've noticed in terms of maybe, because uh, I know you follow sort of the Russian, yes. the Russian um, website. Uh, like that. I, mean, anything I, think, I think it's a bit of a deja vu on, mm -hmm. on what happened in Ukraine, namely the mm -hmm. silence, uh, which will be more, very... Or more power in, the in terms of replacing bishops because they did replace their metropolitan then. Yes. So, yeah. So um, let's get to uh, some questions here, and uh, I'll, I'll give privilege to my co-director George Macapolis, who asks, "What do Christians in the U.S. most What do Christians in the U.S. most misunderstand about the Russian Orthodox Church?" Um, the traditionalism. Mm -hmm. I mean. My, my sense of, of talking to many representatives of, of the US who are engaged with Russians is that they, they really believe that Russian population is very traditional and in, in, in orthodox walks of life and, and that it um, upholds old ideas of um, family. I mean, it's a Soviet, a post-Soviet society. Um, and, and there are so few really committed Christians yeah. And and they completely misunderstand that. So they they're, they're they're kind of idealizing, in other words. Yes, they're completely yeah. idealizing. I mean, they're reading something into Russian reality that is not. Obviously, their Russian interl interlocutors are presenting it to them like this. Right. Um, but they, yes, I think that they, they completely misunderstand that. So this is the question. Wanted to compare a little bit of Russia and Turkey, uh, which I mm -hmm. I recently wrote about. But you've also worked with your former colleague uh, on these questions and. It's a question that says, in the case of both Russia and Turkey, the church is now engaged with non-democratic regimes. Although, if I have a side note, technically, Putin never, has never claimed he's non-democratic, but or Erdogan, but we know that it doesn't quite seem like it's democratic. So where we have seen, so non-democratic regimes, where we have seen in the rededication of Hagia Sophia and the military church in Moscow, where the power is joined forces with the church to minimize secular or Western ways. And that has moved into an anti-democratic discussion. So the question is, where does that factor into this dialogue? Well, I, I mean, I agree with that analysis. I think, I think this is what has happened. So, um, and in a Russian case, I think that's, that's significant because um, 
the Russian Orthodox Church had all reasons, in a way, to stay away from the state after 70 years of, of Soviet oppression by the state. And, and Patriarch Alexei II, he actually was also you know, kind of more cautious of, of really becoming um, a force of the state. Um, and, and that has changed now. So I think the Russian Orthodox Church has decided to support um, the Russian um, authoritarian turn. Yeah. Um, and the military church plays into that. Um, yeah. I mean, it's interesting because it's, it's, it's both for internal and external, right? I mean, there's a sense in which um, it's easy to see how this plays internally, right? But there's a sense in which, in a way that maybe very few predicted that the appropriation of religion, both in Turkey and Russia, has had international global impacts. I mean, what Turkey is doing could, in fact, impact uh, things that are happening in the Middle East, uh, and maybe even beyond. And it, I, the I, same I'm not, Russia I'm, in I'm the Middle East. Russia. I'm not really, sh and I'm not really sure about this too. But I don't know whether. I mean, I I doubt it. But I'm wondering whether there's an analogy about whether there are also others who look to Erdogan as a kind of savior, let's say, as someone who can uh, successfully create. Uh, uh, what is essentially become to some extent, although it still has debates and tensions, what has uh, become to some extent an Islamic state, although perhaps not quite as solidified as he'd like it to be, because that doesn't seem quite as um, uh, stable, let's say, what he's producing as, a, as, a, as it might appear to be. So, so let's see, we have here, um, so who, I think you, you mentioned this, uh, I think already, but maybe just to repeat it, like who were the most important Western influences on the Russian Orthodox Church? Uh, so now the questioner uh, is asking whether it's Billy Graham. Uh, oh, Billy, Billy Graham is, is one of them, Franklin okay. Graham also. Um, very early on, for example, um, John Dobson, uh, mm -hmm. Focus on the Family. Mm -hmm. um, well, then we, had, we have this group, the World Congress of Families, uh, then a whole array of, of pro-life groups um, uh, were influential. And um, maybe at this point, I should also say that there is a, um, there seems to be a kind of competition at one point um, of who has Western contacts. And different groups inside the Orthodox Church have different contacts. So the, the um, external relations department um, um, headed at that point already by uh, Metropolitan Ilarion, um, they have the contact with the Billy Graham Evangelical Association. Um, whereas the whole group around the Patriarchal Commission for Family has contacts with the World Congress of Families and, and um, pro-family groups. And, and they, very, they actually don't interact very much. <laughs> um, so I think this is another thing um, that we have to be aware of that on the Russian side, um, the groups that, that really seek uh, to engage in, in transnational relations with uh, conservative Christians in the West, um, they don't pull in the same direction. They're kind of in competition with each other. And, you know, this is an interesting question from someone in terms of the Russian Orthodox Church's relationship to Putin. Now we've talked about that, but then the questioner asks about Navalny, right? Who, whom we all know was recently po poisoned, mm -hmm. but has survived. Um, is there anybody within the Russian Orthodox Church that dares to have a relationship with this particular strand of the political opposition at all? I mean, is there, I, obviously the institution does not. I mean, that, yes. that can be, that's, we can pretty much guess is certain, but is there anybody within the Orthodox Church that um, dares to have a, a relationship with this particular trajectory of the political opposition? I mean, I wouldn't know of, of any any priest or bishop who has sort of publicly really supported Navalny or associated with Navalny. I mean, of course, we had we had as we already talked about it, this um, petition um, by priests last September in support of, of uh, protesters that were unlawfully detained. Um, and I mean, these protesters had been motivated by Navalny, by Navalny's cause of protesting against fraud elections to the Moscow city but government. That's, but that's significant that they would sign a petition and try to protect protesters inspired by Navalny though. So there's no direct yes. relationship, but there's somewhat of an indirect. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, 
I had a question. I thought I, whether whether you whether you thought the opposition whether there was really any. Um, I mean, I, the, Russia and Turkey. I'm not, again, I'm not an expert in either of these, but I do think in Turkey. I mean, there there are sort of mayors in Ankara and in you know Istanbul that mm -hmm. um, point in many ways to the fact that uh, things aren't as stable for Erdogan as 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 it might seem. Um, I, is there? I, any sign uh, within Russia politically that 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 the regime itself that there are sort of weak spots? Uh, that oh yes, of course. I mean, now this is in a way where Navalny came from when he was on the plane back and he was poisoned. Um, it was a protest uh, around uh, the mayor of Khabarovsk in in eastern Russia, um, who who was accused uh, by 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 the state procurator uh, of terrible crimes, um, of having ordered murders uh, years ago. Um, and, uh, but he, he was very much liked, he is very much liked by, by the population in Khabarovsk and they, they protested against this um, ousting of, of their mayor. Um, there were also protests in Yekaterinburg. Uh, these were against the building of, 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 a, of a cathedral in, in a very popular park. Um, so I think there are actually protests maybe more outside of the center and around issues that are very concrete. Parks mm -hmm. are a big point. I mean, in Moscow, we've also had protests against um, church buildings in, in parks because people feel that um, green space shouldn't be taken away from them. Mm -hmm. um, but there are also interesting protests and I think we should look out for those um, on environmental issues. So mm -hmm. there is a big landfill um, and, and waste landfill uh, site outside Moscow. Uh, where people have protested because it's polluting and it's harmful for health. And and these protesters often find support by priests, by local priests. Oh, okay. And, yes. and so... Mm, and issues could complicate the situation. Yes, so I do think that um, what this basically, if I could um, sort of risk a prediction, I think what this will lead to is, is a bigger split between the church hierarchy that doesn't care about um, these issues that are really close to the heart of, of, of simple believers and parish parishioners and the parishioners and their priests, the local priests who, who are on their side in these, in these situations. Yeah, and that leads to, many, to, some, to some extent to the work done by, by anthropologists, by ethnographers um, who are always you know, pointing to us to, always pointing towards the on the ground lived experience, like our friend Vera Shevzov and Ari Kazenko and others, and mentioned Sarah's work. So, oh, uh, one last question popped up, so if you don't mind. It says, Christina, you insisted on the fact that the ROC's agenda can be independent from Kremlin and has a religious component to it, which I believe to be true and is often overlooked. Can you elaborate on this? Does the ROC's position on Ukraine or Belarus simply coincide with that of the Kremlin as two independently grounded positions? What about issues of abortion in Russian legislation, which seem to be very liberal? Mm -hmm. Okay, so first of all, thank you for the question. And also thank you, Pablo, for being, for being online. Um, I think, so when I say that, that the agenda is independent of the Kremlin, what I basically have in mind is the timeline. Basically saying that the Russian Orthodox Church was in, engaging in a certain way of thinking about social policies um, at a time when it was really not to be expected that these social policies would become the main agenda of the Kremlin. So the traditionalist turn, the turn to traditional values um, that happened in 2012 with Putin, um, that um, was in a way, it was, it was prepared by the church but obviously they can't see the future, so they can't predict. So in that sense, I think uh, it's, it's independent. It sort of has its own dynamic and agenda. Um, but then obviously the moment the state picks up, the state picks up issues very selectively. And abortion is a very interesting topic here. Because if you look at the abortion groups, anti-abortion groups in Russia, some of them are very radical and they describe their activity as an anti-state activity. Mm. So there was a referendum that called for the abolition of, uh, of the right to legal abortion in Russia. The Patriarch even signed, but the Russian Orthodox Church did not make it its own issue. 
And in the interviews we had with different anti-abortion activists, again, one could see that they don't agree on what, what their strategy should be. So the, the Russian Orthodox Church's strategy, the Moscow Patriarchate's strategy, is to interact with the state in a policy of small steps that will make abortion more difficult, will sort of lower the number of abortions, which, you know, by the way, is not a bad idea after the post-Soviet situation of abortions in the country. Mm. Um, but on the whole, the, the, the people inside the Moscow Patriarchate who are engaged in this dialogue with the Ministry of Health, for example, they don't support the idea of, uh, of an abolition. And, and also a few priests we, we had the chance to interview, they also don't support the idea of an abolition because they think it will be more harmful. So there is no, um, there there is no, not sort of one, one strategic line. And I think what's really, again, I want to stress, I think the Kremlin picks up social policy issues that are useful. Mm -hmm. And um, being against gender rights and against the gay marriage is is useful because it's something that um, in Russian society, which is very homophobic and still very deeply, in, has this deeply ingrained experience of um, Soviet prison culture where, where um, homosexuals would be at the, at the lowest bottom of the line. So th there's no, no, never been a process of education about that history, about that experience. So in a way, picking on, on a vulnerable group that people anyway think lowly about, is very easy for them. Mm. For, for the Kremlin. Mm. Um, picking up on women who've had abortions would be much more difficult because it will concern half of the country. They have no interest in doing that. That's interesting, yeah. Uh, one, one last quick question, um, because we've gone a little bit over our time and uh, we thank you so much for uh, giving us the time that you, because we know how busy you are. But so do you think it makes a difference whether you study Orthodox Christianity in Europe from a European background or in the United States? Uh, you've interacted with Americans and uh, obviously with uh, European scholars. I mean, uh, can you maybe, what do you think about that? Well, I think, I think academically it makes a huge difference mm -hmm. because what you have in the, in, in the United States, and I mean, now you'll say, well, you only know Fordham, and it's true. I know Fordham maybe best as an orthodox reality in the United States, but um, that's kind of an identity um, of of a north of orthodoxy as a minority religion in in a western context yeah. um, that that is that is very um, self assured in a way and 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 that and very natural uh, whereas in 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 western europe the old let's say diaspora model still prevails mm. so um, of course we have orthodox churches in, in um, but but they still very much um, in their national ethnic um, linguistic ghettos and and there is not this um, easiness that I that I sort of see in the in the US context well again thinking about four time thinking about public orthodoxy as, 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 as a blog that I that I like a lot of, of going across that borders in dialogue, in debating issues. I think that doesn't happen, um, and I mean church borders in a way, church jurisdiction borders. I think that doesn't happen that much, even in an academic context in Western Europe. Yeah. Um, so in the chat, everybody, I have put in a link to the Post-Secular Conflicts Project. And Christine, I don't know if you wanna add some links to people just to make available. And while no, you're that's doing... okay. If you go to that link, um, you'll also find a link to our um, website of open access publications where you can basically read everything we've published so far. And it's under the research tab, right? I mean, if you go right under the research tab, right, you can find open access uh, and, yes, or it says, it... and dissemination too, right? Yes. The research and dissemination tabs will allow exactly. you to access to this. Because one, one thing that the European Research Council does, and I think it's a very good idea, it obliges us to make all our publications available in open access. That's really amazing. And so there's a lot of work there. And of course, people, um, you've written for Public Orthodoxy quite a few times. So people can go to Public Orthodoxy and just put in your name and find some of the essays that you've written, which relate to the work that you've done, obviously. Um, I much, very much value our relationship and our friendship and your relationship to Fordham Center because you're part of our human rights project, which is Henry Luce funded here in the United States and the ARC has funded your project and Effie's project. And so there's 
clearly, uh, one of the good things is that there's clearly an awareness that more study of orthodoxy needs to occur. And you're doing some of the best, you're really doing some of the best work out there, kind of illuminating both things for people within the Orthodox Church, but also making people realize kind of the global, broader global political impacts of things that are happening uh, between uh, sort of Russia and American evangelicals. And, and so we're looking forward to the monograph you'll also be producing for our Human Rights Project, thank right? And, 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 and everyone, thank you so much for joining us. We thank Christina for joining us and for all the wonderful work that she does. Um, we, we will meet again in two weeks time, but not on Wednesday. It will be a Tuesday, Tuesday, September 29th at 4 p.m. And we'll have uh, Carrie Frederick Frost with us, who's done wonderful work uh, as a theologian, motherhood, deaconess. Um, so we're looking forward to having Carrie with us in two weeks. And then after that, actually, we have quite a treat in having the wonderful historian Elizabeth Clark, actually, uh, from Duke University. So we have quite a few um, uh, people, wonderful conversations lined up. So again, Christina, what can I say? Thank you. It's good to see you. Well, thank you very uh, much. I mean, you, you just said something really. February, but I'm sure we won't now, but I'm sure I'll see you again. Uh, I was supposed to see you in Austria. I uh, know in Rome, I think. In we were, yes. Uh, yeah. We might manage that. Yeah, we'll, we'll work on it. Yeah, well, thank um, you so much for the yeah. questions and thank you for all of those who listened yeah. and for inviting me. It was very right. kind of you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Please visit our website, fordham.edu slash orthodoxy and public orthodoxy. And thank you again, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Christina. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.